God asked Moses to go to Pharaoh, who had a sentence of death on him. God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. When Moses could have just outright have been killed. Uh, God has asked many people in the Bible to do extraordinary things or things that may have gotten them in serious trouble, may have gotten their head chopped off, um, may have gotten them persecuted, may have gotten them starved, may have gotten them put in prison. And... Um, so the question is, what would, ask yourself, what would be the limit? What would, what would I do if God asked me to go through something? What would I, how much would I be willing to go through? Um, <clears throat> that seems to be the theme of the songs that we sang tonight. Is um, Sometimes we'll go through periods of trial, periods of pain. Uh, my bones ache tonight. Must be a weather change on the way. There is. So I knew it. Next time somebody needs to know the weather, just come see me. And I'll let you know. But um, the story that we have tonight, Genesis 22, turn your Bibles there. Um this story here is a unique story. God has never, ever asked anybody to do what he asked Abraham to do before Abraham, and he's never asked anybody since Abraham that I'm aware of. And when I look at this now, I see that what God actually asked Abraham to do, uh, Abraham made it worse than what it really was. And understand that, um, you know those pyramids that are in Mexico and Ecuador and places in South and Central America, those, all those step pyramids that they have, they were really famous for one thing. That is, the rituals that were done on them generally were, was that of human sacrifice. And it wasn't just one per year. It was whole strings of either slaves or enemies that they had captured in warfare, and they would literally line them up and have lines of them stretching out for thousands of yards or meters or whatever, and systematically, one at a time, the high priest on top of the pyramid had a way of opening up the chest cavity and removing the heart while it was still beating, in his hand, of course, blood gushing all over him. And then they would just roll the body down the steps. The skull they would roll down later. And it was just blood everywhere. Blood all over the priest. Blood everywhere. And they would do this for days on end. Just one person after another, as quickly as like an assembly line of, of bloody sacrifices. And all of this was to make their God happy. Well, if their God created them, why is their God so happy in killing them? That doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, this is what they believed. Um, the... God of Islam, Allah, is not really a shade different than all those gods put together. When he requires human blood sacrifices in order to appease him, especially the killing of Jews and Christians and non-Muslims, 
and of course the killing of faithful Muslims in the process of that, blow yourself up or drive an airplane into a building or whatever. So when I look at this story, I see that God never ever intended for Abraham to actually kill Isaac. And he did not say that either. Now that is a mistake that you'll find if you look in the modern translations. They make it out that God actually did say, um, sacrifice thy son. But that's not what God said. It is not what God said. That's a contradiction of what God said. And then it would violate uh, God's own premise that I am the Lord thy God, I change not. God doesn't change his word. God doesn't alter the thing that comes out of his lips. If God would have told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and then an angel comes along and says, oh, God said don't do that, Abraham should have went and plunged a knife into him because he said, God told me to do this, and an angel cannot cannot step over the bounds of God. If God told me to do it, then I have to do it. You're just an angel. What do you know? Uh, but we'll get into that later. There's a lot of beautiful, beautiful things in Genesis 22. Number one is its location. Let's read the first two verses of Genesis chapter 22. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. A man willing to listen to God, not knowing what he said. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. And we're going to find out from a different place in the Bible that God did, or, or Abraham did actually say, thine only begotten son. We're going to find that out. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. The main verb that Abraham is supposed to perform is offer. Not kill, not stab, not burn, not um, slice open, offer. And that is exactly what Abraham did. And you can find, if you go to blueletterbible.org, look at the NIV, at Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2, you will, you will plainly see that they say that God told Abraham to sacrifice him there. Somebody online do that, or somebody here do that. Go to blueletterbible.org and click on the NIV, and then look at Genesis 22, verse 2, and see if it doesn't say sacrifice. See, I'm stepping out on a ledge here because I know the NIV has been altered five times. And the last time I looked, it said offered. Now, they may have changed it back because I caught them and they know it. We'll see. Okay? The, the fact that, here's my thing. My thing is, one of the things that God told me early on, talking about hearing voices and then checking to see if these things are true or not, test the spirits to see whether they be of God, was I got, God got me interested in Bible numbers, but I was afraid to look into it because I thought it was occult numerology. And so I was, no, no you look it up. What does it say? Uh, sometime later, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am. He replied, and God said, take your son, your only son, who you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there. Sacrifice him there. Sacri says to sacrifice him. So what's Abraham supposed to do? 
He's supposed to sacrifice him. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He has to kill him. It, it, that's what God said. If that, if that is what God said, then Abraham... And understand, the, when the Bible talks about the faith of Abraham, and in the book of James, it talks about Abraham's faith was proven by his works. Faith without works is dead. So if God actually said to Abraham, sacrifice him, and Abraham didn't sacrifice him, then what faith is that? What works proved his faith? He didn't do what God said to do. And it may not be like a big deal, but it is to me. These words matter. And if I was in a court of law, and I had was on, was on trial with somebody else for killing somebody, and, the, and somebody told me, kill them. And I went and shot them. I'm only following orders from somebody else. So that makes them more guilty than me because it's a, like a conspiracy thing. But if, but if the guy said, take care of him, and then I shot him, how does, how does the jury know that the guy told me to kill him? He told me to take care of him. Does that mean feed him and clothe him and offer him money or whatever? So it, to me, it, the words make a difference here. Uh, but anyway, I'm studying numbers. And the Lord said the number meaning is going to be in the Genesis chapter. So I was going through these and I got to Genesis 22 and I knew that 22 was a number for revelation. Something's going to be revealed here. And sure enough, this whole story is God revealing his plan to mankind 2,000 years before it ever happened. God is revealing his plan to anyone who would listen. It's, it's a prophecy that came to pass exactly the way it was written. Because number one, uh, let me show you where Mount Moriah was. Is it in my notes here? Here it is. Mount Moriah is where the temple was built in Jerusalem where they offered up the daily sacrifices. So the exact place that God told Abraham to go to was the exact place where they did the daily sacrifices on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. So it's the exact place. The, uh, the time frame, we'll get into the time frame in a little bit. But look, let's look at this number 22 very quickly. Turn to Psalm 22. And you might want to make a little note in your Bible next to Genesis 22. Psalm 22. What is in Psalm 22 if you haven't looked yet? All right, tell me after you look. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those are the exact words spoken by Jesus when he was on the cross. These words were given about 1,100 years before Christ was on the cross. Written by David. David, uh, Solomon was about 1,000 years before Christ. David was about 1,100 years before Christ. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Verse 7, all that they that see me laughing to scorn, they shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. That was the exact words that people spake as they were staring at Jesus on the cross. They said, let's see if, let's see if his God can deliver him. He trusted in God. Why don't he just pray to God and have God send down angels and get him down off the cross if he really trusted in God? If this is really God's son, then surely God's son's not going to die on a cross. Why doesn't he ask God to come down and deliver him? And that was spoken by the people at the foot of the cross. Verse 16, dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Well, that was fulfilled a thousand years later when they took Jesus, 
nailed his hands and his feet together to nail them to the cross. Uh, verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now, some people might say, well, Jesus had it organized to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. He gets on the cross. He knows what Psalm 22 says. And so he blurts out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? To make everybody think he's the Messiah. Yeah, but he doesn't have any control over how they hang him on that cross. And he doesn't have any control over what they did with his garments. He doesn't determine that. That was done by the Roman guards, the Roman soldiers. They parted his garments and cast lots for his vesture. So Jesus did not have that kind of influence. He did not self-fulfill this prophecy. It was done. And at, you have to ask yourself, a thousand years ago, let's go back a thousand years to what, what would that be? A uh, thousand and twenty-two A.D. Does anybody know what happened in a thousand twenty-two A.D.? Anybody know? Huh? Yeah, I think the Crusades were going on then. But if you can't even know what happened in Palestine in the year one thousand twenty-two A.D. How is it that you can know from now what's going to happen in the year, um, so what, is it, what would that be, 2122 A.D.? No, that's only 100 years. 3022 A.D. What's going to happen 1,000 years from today? You don't know. You have no idea. <laughs> Do what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why? He'll be just as good as he is now. Yeah. He might actually get better with age. Who knows? But you see what I'm saying? We don't even know what happened a thousand years ago in the past. Much less know what's going to happen a thousand years from now in the future. Psalm 22 is one of the places, along with Isaiah 53 and others, that nailed it. Nailed it. Got right down to the very words that were spoken, the very things that were done, and who they were done by. That's insane. A thousand year old prophecy being fulfilled right in front of their very eyes. And still they didn't believe. That's one of the beauty things about, about what we believe about the Bible is that it, 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 all of its prophecies are fulfilled. They always are. God never misses a one. Okay. So, and in Psalm 22... Number 22 is the number for revelation. What's God doing in Psalm 22? He's revealing what's going to happen at Calvary. He reveals part of it here in Genesis 22, another part of it here in Psalm 22. So in John chapter 1, verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That who's, This is His begotten Son. This is when God said, Take thy Son, thine only Son, thy begotten Son. And we're going to see it in a minute. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Now look at Hebrews eleven seventeen. This is where it is. 
By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Only begotten son. Now, was um, Isaac the only son? He was the only son of a rightful wife. Hagar and Ishmael don't count. They were not whom the promises were made. Hagar was not a rightful wife. Therefore, Ishmael was not a rightful heir, not a rightful son. So it could be said, this is his only begotten son, because this is the only one begotten through Sarah, whom God made the promise to. 1 John 4, 9, And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Um, now, let's go back to verse 17, Hebrews 11, verse 17. Hebrews 11, of course, is called the Faith Hall of Fame. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, now, Hold, I've got that up on the screen. Look back at Genesis 22, verse 1. I'm going to prove a point to you here. Because the Bible says that God tempts no man. And you have to know the Bible in order to know whether or not this is an actual contradiction or not. The Bible says that God tempts no man, and yet it says clearly here that God did tempt Abraham. So is that, is that an error? Or does God lie? Did God tempt Abraham when later on the Bible says God tempts no man? Well, you have the answer in Hebrews eleven seventeen. 17. The Meaning of the word tempt here does not mean entice to sin. It means exactly what I've been saying all these years. Your faith is always going to be on trial. Always. We've had the unfortunate situation in our church of so many of our men who have passed on. Sister Botwell, Sister Bonnie, uh, leaving Brother Roy, um, Brother Wayne, dying of COVID, uh, leaving Sister Jan. Um, who else? Help me out here. Pam's husband, uh, Dee's husband, huh? Yeah, both Betty Forsyth and Betty, and, and who, who was you saying? Yeah, Linda Carmichael, Jimmy Carmichael. All these men, all these men dying. And I've talked to several of them before, and I won't, I won't say who, who said what. But it's, it's something I've heard before. They would say, yeah, I'm going to be honest. I am a little bit angry with God. I can understand that. I can understand that. But did they give up on God? No. They didn't give up on God. Even though their faith was tried and put on trial, they still believed 
in the love of God. Knowing that it is because of sin that all men must die. This aside from the Lord appearing in the air and calling us alive to be home with him without seeing death. Since that hasn't happened yet, then if, if I'm going to see God and be at home with Jesus, short of him appearing in the clouds, I'm going to have to die to do it. And it's not going to be pleasant for my wife, my children, my grandchildren, this church. It's not going to be a pleasant experience for people to go through that. Likewise, if my wife passed, she's at home with Jesus, but it's not going to be a very happy, pleasant time for me and her children and grandchildren and all the people that love her. It's not going to be a happy time. But is God still God? Yes. God's still God. So that's what it means when it says tempt here, the Bible's always going to answer what that means for you. In case you have a problem with it. When Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. What did he do? Offered him. Why? What did God ask him to do? Offer him. And that he had... Look, at, look up in uh, Matthew. You get that blue letter Bible out. Look up Hebrews eleven seventeen. See what it says there. I'd be curious. When he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. And he had that, he, it wasn't like Abraham, get up, walk over next door and do this. He had three days of walking to think about it. Was about to sacrifice. No, he wasn't. He offered him. Well, I dis I disagree. I think maybe he was. He was. Because he had the he had the knife in the air. But clearly, clearly, according to the way they wrote Hebrews eleven seventeen, they should see that it's that it contradicts Genesis chapter twenty two. It contradicts it. They should see that, but they don't. So anyway, Abraham had three days to think about this on his way out to Mount Moriah. It wasn't like he gets up, walks over to the field next door and does this thing without thinking too much about it. He's got three days of walking, laying there, trying to sleep at night. And the only thing that runs through his mind is God promised me that it was through Isaac. God promised me it was through Isaac. God promised me it was through Isaac. Even if I have to kill Isaac, God's going to resurrect him from the dead. That's what I believe, because God said it was going to be through Isaac, and I believe what God said. And that's how God commended his faith to him. That's what's called the faith of Abraham. So back to Genesis 22. And Abraham, verse 3, rose up early in the morning. And saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. How many people are going to Mount Moriah? Four. How many people built the ark? Four. It's all there, people. Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up. And went unto the place of which God had told him. And again, God told him to go to Mount Moriah. And according to everything that we can tell, Mount Moriah is the temple mount. It is the place where the daily sacrifice would have been held. Offered up sacrifices 
daily. But Christ came to do away with all of that and perform it in the very place where the old things were performed. Now we're going to do away with that. So there is only one sacrifice to be made, and that is the sacrifice of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. It's amazing how all this works out it, to be at the same time in the same place. Now, Genesis 22. Then on the third day, think about it. How long's a day with the Lord? thousand years so they go one day two days two thousand years here's what's interesting if we place the birth of Christ at or around 1 AD we know it's about three or four years off so let's say it was like 4 AD, the birth of Christ. The time of Abraham was exactly 2,000 years before the birth of Christ, 2000 BC. So, 1,000 years, 2,000 years. Not only was it in the same place it was exactly at the same time a day with the Lord being a thousand years one day and then two days two days journey and on the third day they're going to perform this and Abraham walks a thou one day and then he walks another day and at the beginning of the third day on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, watch this, and saw the place afar off. I want you to take your Bible and I want you to underline, underline that phrase, afar off. Afar off. It's an absolutely beautiful phrase. God helped me with this one day. The ability to see afar off. Number one... Without these, I don't have the ability to see afar off. That was noticed in me when I was about in seventh grade. They did the eye test on me at school, and everybody said, Hogger, you did terrible. Thanks a lot. They only get glasses. So sure enough, they, Mom takes me to the eye doctor and they said, yeah, he's nearsighted as a goat. Can't see nothing, so they put glasses on me. And then I remember working with Sterling and I used to make fun of him. Because Sterling would be working and all of a sudden he'd go like this. And I'd always laugh at him. What do you do that for? Well, now I do it. You can't see the line, but it's there. I'm going. And be honest with you, sometimes when I miss the line, the verse on the singing, I'm trying to figure out where that line is so I can see that verse. I, yeah, they, they give you the, the lineless bifocals but sometimes I wish I had a line okay there it is right there sometimes I can't see what verse it is oh well but he lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off anything when the Bible says this term when anything that you can look at afar off you can see into the future so look at what he's doing He's looking, Abraham is looking into the future. Because this whole thing is about what Abraham is, is about to tell Isaac. Okay? Uh, Matthew, let's, let's read um, 
Let's see, do I have verse 5 on here? No, let's, let's study this for a minute. Uh, Matthew, I do want you to look up on that blue letter Bible. Look up Genesis 22, 8 in the NIV. Okay? In Exodus 20, verse 21, And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near under the thick darkness where God was. The, what they were doing at, in Exodus 20 was this was when God was visiting them, giving them the covenant. And the Israelites were standing looking afar off. What they were seeing into the future was Jesus coming, bringing them a new covenant, a covenant of grace. Ezra 3.12, But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house. This is the temple. When the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. That shout, guess when I think that shout is going to be heard again? The rapture. The voice from heaven that there's going to be a shout. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Jeremiah 23, 23. Watch this. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Look what, he's, look what he's doing. Am I not a God at hand? Aren't you glad he's a God at hand? Amen. Hebrews eleven thirteen. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They saw the promises of God into the future, but didn't get to live through them. Brothers and sisters, if you and I are still alive at the coming of the Lord, we're going to see these things right here. Amen. Mm. Second Peter 1, 9. But he, what, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. When you can't see afar off, watch this. What is the number one thing that is afar off for you and I? Heaven. Heaven. And if you don't have enough faith, you don't have enough of God's word in you, you won't be able to see afar off and heaven will be meaningless to you. Because you'll think, well, that's way down the road for me. I want stuff now, like Esau. I want my porridge now, lest I die. He wasn't going to die, and he knew it. That was stupid. But that's how people are. Matthew, what does that say? 22.8, right? Uh, 22, eight. They screwed it up, Chris. They fouled God's word up. I'm not even going to get into that today. But that, I, I just sort of had a feeling they messed it up. Our beloved King James is the only Bible that says it in such a way as you get the full meaning of it. My son, God will provide himself a lamb and God himself was the lamb I heard a story the cathedral quartet um, they had uh, they were this was in a, a time when they were had some really super talented people with them and so uh, they got with a gospel 
music arranger named Larry Goss, and he was very good at orchestrations. And so they hired the London Philharmonic Orchestra to play. They're the ones that did this old house, JR. And um, they had several songs, and, and they were interviewing Mark Trammell, who was in the group at the time, and asked him if he had any good memories from the days when he was with the cathedrals. And he said two things. And he said one of them was we were, we were practicing with the London Philharmonic Orchestra. And he said um, we were doing a rough cut of uh, Danny Funderburk's song, For What Earthly Reason. And he said they were practicing it and we were just practicing the vocals. It wasn't even being recorded at the time. And he said, when we got done singing that song, it had touched the orchestra so much, they stood up and gave them a standing ovation. The orchestra did. But he said, then when we got to the song, God Himself, a Lamb. And it's a beautiful song. It's got beautiful... This is a London Philharmonic Orchestra. They're just playing the beautiful orchestrations of it. Mark said that they were playing through that song... And Danny Funderburk ends the song with God himself, a lamb. And he said, we looked over at the, the um, um, concert master, who is the first violinist. And he said he had tears rolling down his eyes. Just at the thought that God himself provided himself to be the lamb to be slain for the sins of mankind. He said, I'll never forget that as long as I live. And I want to tell you something. When you got new Bibles out there that mess that one up, I want nothing to do with it. The language of the King James is superior in everything that it says. God will provide himself a lamb. Not God himself will provide a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb. Let's bow our heads.